I'll go ahead and get started. I assume a few people are here are going to be This talks about uh, Cassandra and Grails, and my name's Jeff Beck. I'll go quickly over the agenda, so if you don't see anything you like, feel free to get to the other session. Um, first, I want to start with who I am and a little bit about what I know about Grails, so you get a sense of my experience to see whether or not you want to listen. Um, I'm going to tell you what is Cassandra, and a little bit of when and when not to use it. Uh, we're going to go over data modeling for Cassandra as it relates to cases where I think you're going to be using Grails. And really, then we're going to go through what's available in Grails. And I'll show you a little bit of each of these four items and how to use them. Uh, I'll finish up with something that basically goes over uh, which to use and the basic configuration options for just so you have a sense of what terms you can use. Because uh, depending on what you use, everyone's terms are slightly different. But if you have a general sense, it's a lot easier. My name is Jeff Beck, like I said before, I'm an engineer at SmartThings. Uh, we are an Internet of Things company and we use the standard quite a bit for our event data and a lot of our scale problems we're handling with uh, Cassandra. I've been doing production with Cassandra for about two, two and a half years. Uh, I've been working on it full time for about three years uh, as one of my primary data stores. Uh, so I've been through a lot of the change, recent changes with Cassandra and I've used a lot of the legacy things and a lot of the new features that are coming. So hopefully that provides a lot of experience for everyone. Everyone enjoys it. Uh, the other thing I want to say uh, during this talk, feel free to ask questions. I know this is this can be someone out of the wheelhouse for a lot of people. So feel free to jump in and ask questions along the way. I'll cover everything I can and all the slides will be available online. You can always ask me on Twitter and I'll be happy to come. So what does it say? We have this kind of normal uh, bullet points for what it is, but what you really need to know is if you need to replicate across data centers, or you need to scale at really, really high values, the standards probably a good option. Uh, you care about the master list because it helps you scale, and you care about um, tune consistency because there are times when, even across data centers, you're going to want to uh, let's say you store something that absolutely has to be deleted. Right now, you need to make sure it gets deleted. So being able to uh, take the performance hit and do something that is 100% consistent is important at times. And that's something the standard will let you do that a lot of other NoSQL stores uh, don't necessarily have that option. Uh, a lot more are getting the tunable consistency. Next, when do you use Cassandra? If you have really high write throughput, uh, so higher writes than reads, things like that, Cassandra's a very good uh, place to start. Uh, cross data center application, like I said, and cross data center in a sense not, not so much uh, within a few hundred miles, but maybe across the world, going global, uh, maybe Australia, Japan, US East, US West, and a central Europe location. All of those, if you need to span all of those data centers, the is a good tool for that. Um, and you have to have mature data access patterns. So what I mean by that is you have to have a very good understanding of exactly how you're going to get your data out constantly to make sure that, because as you'll see as we go through this, when you data model, it, that matters a lot. So if you aren't sure how you're going to get to your data, you're probably not ready for the standard. So, if you absolutely depend on transactions, Cassandra doesn't have those. You can use these interesting lightweight transactions that are pretty costly for some very specific purposes, but if you are currently really focused on transactions, you, until you move away from that, you probably don't want to go to Cassandra. Uh, if you see uh, Steve and some of his uh, event sourcing talks though, there he is, uh, you should be able to actually not use transactions, you can use event sourcing or other methodologies to get around this requirement before you try to go to Cassandra. So you probably don't want to do both at once because then you have no idea where you went wrong. Um, if you don't know how you're going to access the data, it's 
going to be very, very hard to do a monolith Cassandra. So I would hold off on doing Cassandra. And this one, the last one's a really interesting one. If your programmers and your people running the Cassandra cluster have walls between them, and that's just like, you're not going to change that in your organization, you don't want to run Cassandra. Cassandra requires a very, you're very close to the hardware, and you're very close to the operations of running the cluster to really do it well. So that's something you're going to want to make sure your, your software teams and your ops teams are combined and can work nicely together. DevOps culture or whatever you want to call it. But there can't be a lot of barriers, and if you're in that environment where it takes a day to get a response from ops on why a service is acting up, you just don't try to save your head. Fix that problem first, and then you can move on to the standard. Day one. You're going to mess this up. Really, I mean, I still mess it up, and I've been doing it for three years. Uh, data modeling with Cassandra is just very hard. Don't be surprised if you make mistakes. Iterate as much as you can. Test before you go to production, of course. But in general, you're going to have to focus on the, the span out on write. So right now, in SQL, uh, normal uh, SQL, you can decide, oh, I'm going to read from with a join across four or five tables to get that data out the way you need. And in Cassandra, that's this just flash. Uh, in Cassandra, what you want to do is you write it to all the places you're going to read it from. So you do lots of data duplication. And that's not bad. That's actually that's what you want to focus on. Because Cassandra is write tuned. So it's much faster at writes than reads. Now reads are quick, but there's no joins. So you can never join. It's just not something that ever exists. Um, and you're not really focusing on the data that you're storing in Cassandra. You're focusing on the query. So a good example of that is, and we'll, get, we'll show it a little later, but a logins. Like if I want to remember all logins a user has ever attempted, because I want to do some like editing, I'm going to store the data in such a way to make sure I can display it back. So I care about looking up my username, by whether or not they failed, and things like that. So how, how I want to get that data back out is what I think about when I design that, that structure in Cassandra. So just duplicate your data, it's fine. Um, a good compound primary key. So in Cassandra, there, it uses heavy use of compound primary keys in order to, if you have a primary key that has three or four parts, you can query by everything from left to right, uh, not skipping any step along the way of that compound primary key. So what will happen is if you can use natural compound primary keys, so the example would be like, for a login example, a user's username and whether or not they were successful may make up, and then like a timestamp. Those three parts can be the primary key. And you don't want to just assign an arbitrary UUID because now you have no way of looking up this UUID. That may be the final, you may want to have that as the final part of a compound primary key to make sure you can, like if you're not tracking uh, time, you could add a UUID at the end after username and success or failure just to make sure you can see all the individual instances. But the other thing is, there is a, something called a secondary index in Cassandra. Unless you understand how it works under the covers, don't use it. It's the simplest answer. Um, it, it works in a, such a narrow use case, uh, it's kind of disappointing they put it in and call it a secondary index because it, it's just very limited when you can actually use it. And I will say, hire a consultant. Uh, everywhere I've worked, we, we always hire a consultant, uh, usually from data stacks or someone else that has expertise and knowledge of Cassandra, like that people have built it. Because that's really where we run into problems. It's under scale, we realize we didn't do something quite right, we need someone to help kind of point us in the right direction. Um, I know it's not a popular option to basically tell everyone to hire a consultant, but I don't think uh, Cassandra is something you can just jump into very easily. It will take a lot of time to get out there. But there's a lot of benefit, but it's not an easy thing to jump into. All right. So here's an example of that compound primary key. And so everything that's in the, on this, I can't really tell the difference, but primary key is in a slightly different font to the right. Um, all of that is actually in CQL. 
So CQL, not SQL, it's I hate that they made it so close, so it's really hard to say. Um, so there is uh, a language that we can use to define some of these things. And this is an example of how you do it. And you can always query, like I said, left to right. You can't ever skip anything. So if you have three parts, you can't use just the first and the last one. You'll always have to go left to right. And so ordering of your primary key matters. So it, like for example, in, if we're doing this as logging, uh, like first name, last name, I, can't, I don't ever want to put the time stamp at the beginning because that's the thing I probably don't have. I probably don't have a time stamp. I want to kind of group everything else together. Into the actual um, data modeling example that I uh, we're going to store every login, and we want to look it up a couple different ways. Now, let's see if I can see. Did that actually? No, that should not be. Right. So, this is a SQL example of the login that has data model. Uh, you'll notice that it looks pretty straightforward. We have text, booleans, uh, timestamp. Uh, timestamp is a little special. Uh, it basically ends up getting stored as a timestamp. It's UUID under the covers. You usually don't need to care. It's just a timestamp to you. Um, this is the primary key that I actually use for our login attempts table. Uh, username, successful or not, and date created. And I almost always uh, query on username and whether or not they're successful. And then I can actually, since I have the created as part of the primary key, uh, I can use that as an order. So I can pull it back out in reverse order. Because the other thing is, if you're trying to do ordering out of Cassandra, it needs to be part of the primary key, or you need to order it once you pull it out. Most of the time, you want, if you can, stick it uh, in the primary key so you can do some natural ordering. The problem is, of course, if I didn't uh, use successful as part of my query, I couldn't use the date created as the order because I would be skipping something along the way as part of the primary key. So, like I said, even you can't skip even if you're using things with the order. It, it's a little tricky and you will mess up because it took me three tries to get this right. <laughs> it looks really simple. The first time I did it, I uh, left successful off and I realized that, uh, our date created was dropping seconds and I was coalescing things wrong. Like that's not counting anything correctly. So you'll mess, you'll mess up a few times, but it's fine. If you can model everything as this idempotent upsert, which is a nice complicated term. Um, oh, still zoomed in. Alright. If you can model everything as an idempotent upsert, that's perfect for Sandra. So what I mean by that is, if we think in terms of rest, instead of doing a post, do everything as a put, uh, because a put is idempotent, it doesn't matter how many times we send it. Uh, and everything's an upsert, so we don't need to worry. Everything in is an upsert no matter what. So think of it that way and model it that way. If you do an update, even in, your, in the drivers, you call update, and it doesn't have to be there, it's not going to fail. It's just going to write it. it. It thinks of everything as an upsert. So you also, in this model, in an upsert model, you don't want to do reads before writes. Since Cassandra is write optimized, if you can model your workflow to just be like, okay, well, I have all my data, I'm just going to write it, I don't need to read, check to see if the state change. The more that you can do that, such as with things like event sourcing, it works really well with Cassandra, and you're not going to get to these weird patterns of, I read the data, but something else updated, and I didn't get that fast enough. Because you're not blocking with transactions, so you really have to worry about that. So if you can do it, this is probably the hardest thing. I can't, we can't always model things this way, but if you can, it makes your life easier with Cassandra. So that's kind of my Cassandra quick overview. Does anyone have any questions they want to cover about Cassandra itself before we dig in? Yeah. Could it, if I, I change my primary key later? No. Well, you can, but your data will no longer be accessible. Um, in future versions of Cassandra, there will be tools in place to help you kind of basically take all the data out of one table and put it in another. And it sounds like under the covers, it's actually going to use Spark. Because 
it's not built into Grails and it probably never, they don't want to build it into Grails, but in the future there will be tools to do that. Right now, um, when we have to do big schema changes like that, we will actually write two places at once for whatever period of time we need to, and then maybe do a migration if we have to. Uh, if we're doing time series data or something like that, we can usually say, oh, a week or two week window is enough to write to two places, then we can kill the old one and start using the new functionality. But yeah, schema changes are very hard to say. So, for Grails, we have, well, there's lots of things, but I'd say right now there's four main areas to look at. Um, we have two ORMs and two kind of libraries to directly talk with uh, Cassandra. So, the ORMs, I, I think, are really nice for quick prototyping and things like that, and I'll use them, but I always worry when I'm using an object relational model, like object relational never into uh, a system that doesn't have relations. So you have this kind of constant mismatch that, so you're kind of shoving something into a standard that doesn't quite fit. Now, the, what I've done in the past is, it's, I will model all of my relations as domain objects. So, for example, if I have a user and a subscription, I'll also have a user subscription. So, kind of like a joint table, but I model all of those very explicitly, and then I depend on a strong service layer to interact with the many domains kind of that thing out on the right portion. But that's where you're really going to have to know whether or not it's worth that effort for you to use the mapper, or maybe it's better to work directly with Cassandra and work with some of these direct access plugins. So I'm sorry the two top ones have weird names. Uh, the links work. Uh, Cassandra ORM is the Cassandra object mapper. Uh, it's the older of the two. Uh, the Cassandra Gorm, uh, it's just called the Cassandra plugin, I believe, in the plugin portal, but it gets confusing, so I, I like to call it Cassandra Gorm. Okay. The ORM plugin is going to be based on top of Astyonix, which is uh, a library from Netflix, and it's all based around Thrift. So, if you don't know, Cassandra right now has two main ways of interacting with it. You can interact via the native protocol which is CQL and like the Java native driver, that's what it uses. And there's something called Thrift that you can use, which is an older way of accessing it. So the data modeling between Thrift and between CQL are slightly different. So CQL3 is completely backwards compatible, but if you create things with new CQL3, you might not be able to get to them from Thrift, depending on what you're doing. And not all of the features are available in Thrift that are available. <coughs> So this one has lots of advantages though, because it's, it's an old mature plugin that has built-in counters, indices, relations, and something called like span domain. So what I mean, so counters is there's a way to specify that every time you insert data, you want to keep track of this count. Now in Cassandra, since there's no way to arbitrarily query data and get counts, you have to kind of keep track of the counts as you insert it. This plugin takes care of that and counters for you. Uh, same with indexes. So in, in, in Cassandra, you don't really use normal indexes. What you'll do is you'll create a new table that kind of acts as a reverse index for you. Uh, sorry, inverted index. And then what we'll do is this will do all of that for you under the covers. But at the same time, uh, the only way to then access the data is back through your application. So, because there's no easy way to translate all of the work it did to figure out what index to sort where is all, unless you really understand the plugin source, you're going to have to go through the application layer every time to, to start querying Cassandra, which in some ways is fine, but I, I personally count as a drawback. Uh, the other thing is with this plugin, bootstrapping uh, is a little weird. So it will add a lot of dynamic methods onto your, your static classes. But what happens is, if it gets applied later in the chain, you'll sometimes have something like Rabbit uh, plugin start consuming messages, and then try to do work on Cassandra object before they've been bootstrapped, and so they just get method missing exceptions for a little while before it can start out. Um, you can fix this by making sure you don't start Rabbit consuming until bootstrapping is done, and in bootstrapping you can explicitly call it out. But it's a little more wiring than you have to do with other things, so it's a little bit of a drawback. 
Um, it's based on Thrift, which I personally find is a drawback because all new features and development in Cassandra are focused on CQL and native protocol. Um, an object. So this is uh, an example object. It's modeled slightly after the forum, but not quite. You'll notice that we have this static Cassandra mapping. That's kind of where the special sauce of the plugin lives. So you'll see that we have counters down at the bottom, and this group by counter is basically creating a count, a group by those things for the unique uh, counts of execution statuses within a shard for a schedule time. Um, does all that under the covers, and you also see we have the four indexes. And these look like the primary keys of before where you can't skip a step if you're defining these, but you'll notice you're able to, uh, the last two is really nice, time bucket shard, and then you have time bucket shard execution status. So you can also make a new one that flipped order and things like that. So this is going to deal with the, the problem of your primary key being complicated, and it deal, it has to go for functionality to re-index everything, but it does, the way it does it is very expensive. So to kick off a re-index, you're gonna have to read all your data. And if you're using Cassandra, you're probably at a right, like, a right workload that's too high to ever justify reading all your data without some major matching and things like that. So that's why it works, but it's not gonna be the best. And unindexed primary key is something you say when you don't want the primary key you gave it to have an explicit index built. Basically, most of the time, you're gonna want that. It's just kind of the way the plugin works. So once you have it, you're gonna be able to uh, query a few different ways. So you'll see it looks a lot like Forum. It just isn't. Uh, but it's modeled after Forum, so a lot of things have the same semantics, so it, it works pretty well. The, the special ones come in when you want to do a more complex query. So at the beginning, we had mentioned uh, that we had cons tunable consistency. So this scheduler event service, we can change the consistency level uh, in Cassandra. So we can ask for just one, one replica to tell us what it is, or we can ask for multiple, and we can keep moving from there. Uh, this is a more complex query, and you can also use counters. Uh, this basically works as, as once you get the hang of the get counts group by uh, syntax that is kind of defined. It's pretty easy, it works like normal queries, and you once again can tune the consistency level. We have an expando map, which is something this plugin kind of excels at, and what this does, if you define this map data as an expando map, what ends up happening in Cassandra is each new item becomes a new column in the row. So you can, in, rows in Cassandra don't have to have uniform columns. You can have arbitrary number of columns in any row, uh, up to a two big max. You won't get that big most of the time. But, so this allows you to do this kind of wide row um, and you can store arbitrary data. So when you're doing an upsert, you, can, you could, with this, only update the, 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 the data you need and then it can basically end up merging with the data that's already there. So if you have two correct requests come in and you have um, like a data point A and a data point B, one from each request, and you do an insert, if you're using the expand map, they're not going to collide because they end up in two different columns. And then when you read, you'll get both out. Um, 
It can autocrate to the schema, which is very handy. Uh, it has the same forms and text as everything else. And so if you're using the other NoSQL forms, you'll notice when you get to an area like if you ask for a transaction where it's not supported, you're going to go ahead and get an exception that basically says there's no transaction range. The drawbacks, which is somewhat big, uh, it allows the use of these intercept theory indexes, which I think is a fault because they probably, like especially when you're using ORM, you're probably going to mess them up and cause a hotspot in your data. Um, it's an all or nothing mapping right now. So every every domain in your Rails application has to have a corresponding table, table in, in Cassandra for this to work right now. That is not a technological problem, that's an implementation skill. So what, that's a pending fix uh, that needs to happen on the, on the plugin. So if you really needed this and wanted to make a fix, that would be great. I'm sure the developers will get back to working on the fix. Um, so an example of the object, once again, this just looks like, exactly like Gorum. Uh, uh, so there's nothing that special to see. The, the big thing is you'll notice that we we do this ID uh, generator assign. Uh, we do that just because of we want to always add a UUID and we want it to be assigned by us, uh, mostly so we can support puts and things like that. Example query, uh, it, for the last one, we can only do git. So you'll notice that, that this one doesn't have a primary key. Uh, oh, I didn't show you the C code. This one doesn't have a primary key other than the UUID. So the problem with that is literally the only query we can do now is subscription.kit. Because any of the find bots are going to try to use uh, the primary keys, and there basically won't be any index for it to use. And that's why you want to use this compound primary key, which I should see the coming. So the compound primary key allows us, for a person now, we're going to use a first name and a last name, and we also use their age. So you'll notice that we have this new primary key mapping inside of uh, the static mapping block. And what that's doing is basically saying how to, what order and what type it, uh, the primary key to use uh, for each of these. So that way you could, if you want to keep things alphabetical in your mapping, you can do your order whatever way you want right there. Um, the important part is this partition versus cluster. I didn't go over this before, but if you're using a part, if you have multiple parts of a partition in your primary key, what all that means is they're required fields and you'll never be able to not query by, like if you have two part, a two part partition key, you have to always use both parts of it. And what that ends up doing is in Cassandra, it says which node in the ring it ends up on. So you can never only query by one half of it because it would span multiple nodes and basically Cassandra would never let you do that. That's why there's no joins. So we have uh, a few more ways to query. The query now, because we did the multiple of the primary key. And you'll notice that just works like normal uh, Jumping into uh, the non ORM mapper things now. So, Astionics plugin uh, is basically a really simple wrapper that will provide direct access to Cassandra. It works with the legacy, legacy thrift tables, which is nice. Uh, and it has the features of modern Cassandra clients. So, what I mean by that is a few years ago, not all Cassandra clients <coughs> had these kind of basics which is unique client-side load balancing, token aware, and no discovery. And if we have time at the end, I can have to go through what those are in Cassandra. But basically, any client you use needs these three things. Otherwise, you shouldn't be using the client. Like the old the only ones left that don't even have it, I think it's Hector, and it has most of it. Uh, drawbacks. Um, it's a slightly outdated view of Cassandra. Because it's thrift, a lot of the terms they use are no longer the right terms because Cassandra has gone through a little internal rebranding. So tables used to be called column families. 
and things like that. So when you're working in this model, you have to do this mental transition between, oh yeah, they call these things common campus at this point. It's not terrible, but it's not the fun, fun best. Um, it's still supported by Netflix, but you're not seeing the kind of daily contributions that you do with the Java native driver. And you have to do a lot of configuration to get a sensible start. So an example, uh, an example interaction looks something like this. So this is where we're putting an arbitrary column on a row. And you kind of see key space, location batch, consistency levels. You kind of have to deal with all the nitty gritty. But if you're really wanting to really dig in and tune a particular query, this is exactly what it's good for. The Java Native Driver is basically the new kit on the block. It is made by DataStax, which is one of the main supporters of Cassandra. And it works really well. It has a lot of new features going into it. We have asynchronous calls built in, which is really nice. Um, default configuration is going to be very sensible for you. You don't have to learn a lot to get to jump in. Uh, it's under active development, and you'll get, you're going to get much better performance with this in Cassandra 2.1 and above because of optimizations they're adding into Cassandra itself. Because this is really where they're focusing that happens. Low level is it, it's. It's very low level, and uh, it's hard to wire up and manage your own connections. So, what we do, um, what, well, what I do is I have this. There'll be slides, you don't have to read it that in depth, but I just kind of want to walk through it. Uh, in order to deal with my own uh, sessions, I have to set it up as an initializing being with after property set. So that I can force it, so I can force it to finish uh, operating and checking all the sessions before, and then I can use post construct in other being other services that need to depend on this service. So in order to make sure things get booted at the right order, uh, I do it this way, and it seems to be about the best way to do it right now. Uh, I'm sure in the future there may be better ways. Um, you'll notice that this config right here is my default config. And this is what I would suggest most people start with. Um, you'll notice that uh, we have a retry policy. And I didn't talk much about that, but basically, if the request fails, um, almost every client will automatically retry the request. Now, that's important because just because a request failed it doesn't mean it failed on Cassandra. It just means you didn't get a response. So writes can succeed in the cloud, like in Cassandra, and fail on your client, and you'll retry it. So that's why you'll want to use idempotent um, upserts because then you know it's not going to have a problem when you do these auto retries. So if you're using the built-in Cassandra counters before 2.0, uh, they are not idempotent. So you'll, these retries will skew your uh, counts. So if the count is fine for, for an estimation, that's then you can use it. But if you need actual hard numbers, you won't be able to use the retry, the counters built into Cassandra. So kind of avoid, it's kind of like, there's a lot of rough edges to Cassandra of things that there are very specific use cases where it works really well, and they're in there, but they're not general use. And counters and secondary indexes are both those things. Um, we also have this load balance policy. Um, you pretty much always want to use token aware and DC aware. Uh, so data center aware just means it's going to tend to connect to the local data center and not try to go, like, if this is based in the UK, you're not going to try to call it to a Spanish data center, and vice versa. Um, it does keep one connection open for failure. So it will go there if none of them none are currently available. Uh, token aware, basically, in Cassandra, with your, with your primary key, you know which node in the cluster it's at. So what this does is it tries to connect directly to that node in order to get a response faster. And you pretty much always want to run that. Um, oh, contact points, uh, also known as seeds. Uh, these are where you're going to connect and talk to uh, Cassandra. 
So you can su supply as many as you want. Um, most of the, you don't ever want to supply just one because the sander knows it fail. You probably don't want to supply your entire cluster because then you have to maintain all of your all of your <coughs> for your nodes in some configuration file. So you usually end up using two to three, and it can figure out every other node in the cluster by talking to these. So it's going to talk to a seed and get all of the other IPs for the cluster. All right. So this is something that actually uses, and I just wanted to show, this is what I'm doing is, I'm using the post construct to then prepare all the statements. So I, I, what I want to do is use prepared uh, CQL statements in Cassandra because it's going to be the most performant. And by depending on the CQL session service and doing this as post construct, it makes sure that my, all my, my sessions get connected and I connect to my cluster, I can then prepare all my statements before starting to do, do work in the cluster, like in my preferred as that. And that's really been working well for us. And what will also happen is we will fail hard at this point if uh, column families or tables aren't defined. And that, that's ideal for us because we don't want to deploy code that can never work. We, we'd rather fail a deployment early and realize we, we we're deploying something early before we migrate against it. So that's too close. I wanted to make an easy reference to try to figure out what to use when. And the other thing is the each of these, like the ORM and the native and the native direct things, are not uh, mutually exclusive. There's no reason you can't use Cassandra ORM and Axionics at the same time. And there's no reason you can't use Cassandra form and the native driver at the same time. What you probably don't want to do is mix. Like, you wouldn't want to try to use the Java native driver with the ORM plugin, and because you're getting these weird conflicting models of thrift versus CQL, and basically above the line legacy, below the line modern. That's the way I like to think of it. Uh, just a really easy, if you have existing, if you're already using Cassandra and you're just trying to use Rails with it, you can jump in uh, that way. And then to show, just go over, touch briefly on token aware, DC aware. Um, so even if you're not running more than one data center, in general, you always want to set Cassandra up to think it's in multiple data centers and just say you only have one data center because what happens is it's very easy to then add a new data center and migrate things around or fail over because you've already set all you have to do is add a new data center to something that's configured as data center aware is pretty easy, but switching from something that's a simple network topology, which is the other thing that you can use, it becomes very hard to migrate. So in general, just stick with anything that's focused on data centers already. It's going to make your life a lot easier. Um, your seeds uh, will be talked about on both the Cassandra side and the client side. Your seeds on the Cassandra side are the known Cassandra nodes that nodes talk to when they come online, because Cassandra acts, activates a acts as a cluster and will talk to these nodes and kind of join. And then you also have to have seeds on your client side. And those are just what the client talks to first to know. There's no reason they have to be the same nodes. But we find it easier to make them the same nodes because then we have one piece of external configuration, one place that we can depend on in two different config files. Um, I talked about retries. You'll want to always set them up. And we have just a few minutes left, right? Okay, good. So I wanted to answer questions for five minutes. And if there's no questions, I have a whole bunch of glossary items and cool tools to show. Is there any questions? Yeah. Is every time you do an insert in Cassandra, uh, everything in Cassandra is an immutable map, 
basically, under the covers on disk. And then those are joined together um, to give you the real view. And it works well, but you just have to understand what's going on under the covers before you try to push it a certain way. Uh, a really good example of fan out on write would be if I want to query by both like a person's last name and by, um, let's say, their state. I'm going to write to both a table that has a primary key of the state, a whole user record, and a primary key with their last name, a whole user record. So I can just make one query and pull out <coughs> that whole user record. But in your database, in Cassandra, you now have that record twice. So that's a really common access pattern in Cassandra. Any other questions? Okay, well, cool tools that you will want to use. Uh, CCM is the Cassandra cluster manager. Uh, it will spin up a three, uh, well, I use a three node, you can use whatever many node cluster you want locally, and kind of test, like taking nodes down, putting them in different data centers. It's probably the quickest, easiest way to set up Cassandra, and it's also a great way to set up different versions. So if you want to test 2.0 and 2.1, or some of the new things, that, that's a really great, great dev tool. Uh, Dev Center is from DataStacks. It kind of it's just uh, a visual query editor. It has a nice uh, format for results. And then the last two are uh, tools to manage your schema. Uh, so right now, uh, Cassandra Migration is what my company uh, uses, and we write CQL or CLI files. That so CLI files for the thrift. Uh, we use both of those and we migrate to make sure we have the latest uh, data model up in production before we deploy. And we do all that. Um, it's kind of like liquid based, but not as fully fleshed out. And Pillar is a similar uh, thing, except it also allows um, a way to back out of. Uh, and everything can also have rollbacks, but it doesn't support uh, deploying multiple nodes at a time. So something always has to be deployed to do the migration and then uh, you can do the rest of your deploy. The Cassandra migration is designed with some of the lightweight work, lightweight transactions built in to modern Cassandra that are expensive, but for migrating data models, it's fine. Um, to make sure that you can deploy three or four nodes with the new code, and only one of them will deal with the upgrading the, the schema. So, yeah, that's about all the time I have, I believe. I can keep answering questions until they can help them. Oh, yeah, sorry. Thank <laughs> you. 